Welcome to Electron Online, and here we're going to do another example regarding the effective nuclear charge, or Z effective. And as we saw in an earlier video, if we take a look at the lithium atom, lithium, we have three positive charges in the nucleus, because we have three protons, we have three electrons in orbitals around the nucleus, we have two in the innermost energy level, and a third in the second energy level. Now, we have learned that the effect of Z, Z effective, of a lithium atom is only 1.26 positive charges at the nucleus. With other words, this outer electron is affected by the nucleus as if there's only 1.26 positive charges there instead of three positive charges. Well, based upon that, we should be able to predict the radius of a lithium atom. If the outermost electron seems to feel only an attractive force due to, due to an effective nuclear charge of 1.26, we should be able to figure out how big a lithium atom actually is. Well, you say, how can we do that? Well, there's a balance of forces here. We have the electron zipping around the nucleus at very high velocities, and so the, the uh, what we call the centripetal force would have to be equal to the Coulomb force in order to keep it into orbit. So we could say that the centripetal force, force centripetal, must equal to force Coulomb, the Coulomb charge, the attractive well, let's see, I shouldn't use C in both cases, otherwise you get very confused. Let's just use Q for charge. So the force due to the centripetal motion is actually equal to the Coulomb force, the force of attraction between the two charges. We have a positive charge there, we have a negative charge there, and they attract each other. So the centripetal force can be written as mv squared over r, and the Coulomb force is equal to k, times the charge of the electron, times the charge of the nucleus, divided by the distance between them squared. And so we have to take that equation and solve for r. Now you can see there's an r here, there's an r there, so this r cancels out that r. But the problem if I solve that equation for r is that I do not know what my velocity is. But I do know that electrons, they behave like waves, so they have wave-like properties, and electrons have to move around the nucleus in the, sh in the form of a wave. And since the electron is in the second energy level, the circumference of the path of that electron, which is the length of one orbit, should equal two wavelengths of the electron. It's only one wavelength in the innermost energy level, and it's two wavelengths for that one. So we know that the wavelength of an electron is equal to h divided by the momentum, p, which is equal to h, divided by m times v, the mass times its velocity. So if we solve that equation for velocity, we can say that velocity is equal to h, divided by m times the wavelength. And since the wavelength is going to be equal to half a circumference, well, therefore it's going to be equal to pi times r. So v is equal to h, divided by m times pi r, which is a half a circumference, a half orbit, since, of course, in the second energy level, the uh, electron moves around the path in, with two wavelengths being equal to the full circumference, or one wavelength equal to a half circumference. All right, I can now replace V by this quantity right here and plug it in here. So we have M times V squared, which is H squared, divided by M squared pi squared times R squared. So I simply replace V squared by this quantity right there. And that's equal to K times the charge of the electron times the charge of the center, the nucleus, divided by R. Of course, Q, the big Q, is actually the effective charge, not the actual charge that we have to use. Now again, notice that we have an R squared there and an R, so this R cancels out that R. Now I can move this R over here and move all this down here, so we have M H squared. Oh, one more thing, one more simplification. I see that I have an M in the numerator and I have an m squared in the denominator. So in the numerator I have h squared divided by 1m, a pi squared. Uh, this radius right here, I'm going to move it up there. So I have this k coming down here, this q coming down here, and the big q coming down here equals r going up there. So now I have r isolated. I'm now going to turn the equation around. So let's come over here. So the radius of a lithium atom is going to be equal to h squared, this is of course Planck's constant squared, divided by the mass, divided by pi squared, by a k, times 
times small q, big Q. Small q, charge of the electron, big Q, charge of the effective nucleus, the effective charge on the nucleus. Okay, let's plug in some numbers. H is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds. And we have to square that. There we go. Um, let me uh, move this over a little bit. So this is m pi squared. And this is, of course, the exponent 2. Divided by the mass of the electron, 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. Times pi squared, that's easy enough, pi squared. Times k, k is uh, 9.0 times 10 to the 9th. That would be uh, newtons meter squared per coulomb squared. Coulombs is a unit of charge. Divide by the charge of electron, which is uh, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And then the charge of the, the effective charge of the nucleus, which would be 1.26 times that amount. So it would be 1.26 times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. All right, I know the electron is a negative charge and the nucleus is a positive charge, but we don't care. We simply care about the absolute value of that amount because we're looking for the radius. Now, if we work this out, we should be able to get the radius of a lithium atom based upon the effective charge of the nucleus and based upon the principle that the centripetal force has to be equal to the force of attraction between the electron and the nucleus. So let's find out if we get the right value. 6.626 e to the 34 minus, we have to square that. We divide that by the mass, 9.1 e to the 31 minus, divide by pi squared, divide by 9 e to the 9th, divide by 1.6 e to the 19 minus, let's square that because we have two of them, and then divide by 1.26, and I get 168 picometers. So R equals 168 picometers, which very closely matches the radius of lithium atom that you'll find in your textbook. In your textbook, you'll probably say something like one, 152 or 155 picometers, but notice that we're getting something very, very close to the measured amount. And remember that the radius of an atom depends upon how you want to look at it, but from a theoretical calculated value, based upon the effective Z, the effective nuclear charge of a lithium atom, as the, the way the third electron sees it in the second orbit, or the second energy level, I should say, um, we found that the radius very closely matches the actual radius that we can measure empirically. So, a nice example of how the effective nuclear charge plays a role in shaping the size of the atoms 